go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for the webinar today. Um, the American Sustainable Business Council is very happy to be hosting Matt Stoller this afternoon from the American Economic Liberties Project. And for those that don't know, the ASBC is a member-based organization serving the interests of responsible business owners, their customers, and other stakeholders in the space. Uh, founded in 2009, ASBC membership represents over 250,000 businesses in a wide range of industries. ASBC advocates for policy change and informs business owners, policymakers, and the public about the need and opportunities for building a vibrant, broadly prosperous, and sustainable economy. So this afternoon, Matt is going to go over a history of how policymakers on both sides of the aisle have failed to protect our economy um, from monopolization and how this directly affects the small business sector. And as we're in the middle of multiple crises, uh, now seems like a good opportunity to harness the social momentum calling for a fair economy that works for all. Matt is the Director of Research at the, Econo at the American Economic Liberties Project and the author of Goliath, The Hundred Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy, which I highly recommend. Um, Matt worked for a member of the Financial Services Committee in the U.S. House of Representatives during the financial crisis. His 2012 Law Review article on the foreclosure crisis uh, called The Housing Crash and the End of American Citizenship predicted the rise of autocratic political forces. His 2016 Atlantic article, How Democrats Killed Their Populist Soul, helped inspire the new anti-monopoly movement. His writing has appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, Fast Company, a bunch of other places. Um, and Stoller writes a monopoly-focused newsletter called Big with uh, tens of thousands of subscribers. And um, I'll put a link for that in the chat in case anybody would like to subscribe. Um, so uh, please feel free to put all of your questions in the chat or Q&A and I'll uh, get through those after Matt speaks. And with that, I will turn it over to Matt. And yeah, very excited. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for having me. And um, you know, the the I I really appreciate um, uh, you putting on this event, and um, I appreciate the American Sustainable Business Council for what you do and and how you do it. So I'm Matt uh, Matt Stoller. And I'm the research director for the American Economic Liberties Project. So we are an advocacy group that seeks to put the need for honest business at the core of our politics. Uh, so I, I read a newsletter, as you mentioned, and I, I came out with a book last year called Goliath, The Hundred Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy. And what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, is uh, actually comes from the research from that book. Uh, so in, in America today, we have a monopoly crisis. And I'm sure you as business people see this in some areas that you work in. Uh, there's concentrated power in almost every part of American commerce, big markets like uh, cable or search or social media, pharmaceuticals, but also in small markets, uh, tabletop games, missiles and munitions, those kinds of things. I write a lot about this in, um, in my uh, newsletter and I'm constantly hearing of new areas where there has been consolidation. Now, why are monopolies a problem? Well, they, they generate wage inequality, um, raise prices and suppress wages if you have market power. They undermine innovation. Um, the phrase, the, the best reward of a monopolist is a, is a quiet life. Uh, they undermine entrepreneurship, they generate regional inequality, and they damage democracy. But more, more fundamentally, on a, on a personal and visceral level, they generate fear, right? So I have a lot of respect for what you do and how you think, because in my opinion, one of the single biggest political problems we have in America today is that the voice of honest business has been missing in the halls of power. And I think one of the main reasons for that is fear. So here's a quote from David Cicilline, who's a congressman, and this is what he said last year about the power of large technology firms. Because while there are monopolies everywhere, the, the sort of pace setters are in big tech. So here's what he said. It is far too common to hear horror stories from startups and other small businesses about how a dominant platform's abrupt algorithm changes have destroyed their business. So that was at a hearing 
on big tech, which is part of a broad investigation that Congress is now doing in the antitrust subcommittee on the power of four companies. So Cicilline was talking about companies like Amazon, who have under their control the fate of hundreds of thousands of independent businesses. But I hear this sentiment uh, all the time from business people of all walks of life who are afraid to speak out for what is right for fear of the powerful entities on who they depend. So a number of different sectors, franchising, private equity, construction, business software, office supplies, cheerleading uniform sales, uh, syringes, beer distribution. This fear is pervasive. I'm sure you've probably felt it yourself in that moment where you have to decide whether to take a risk and speak out honestly or remain silent to protect your property. Now, having to face that choice is un-American. And the goal of our work, and it seems weird to say that, but it's true. The goal of our work uh, at ALP is to help us see beyond the limits of our noisy politics and understand the arrangements of power all around us that are embedded in our commercial institutions and the laws that structure them because how we do business is how we do justice. And you know this in your bones because you're business people. You know it's important for business to happen honestly because dishonest business, monopolies, corrosive financial arrangements, they warp our society and our ability to be a free people. Now, antitrust law, which hasn't been used a lot in the last 40 years, but that's the main legal tool that's meant to deal with monopolies. And it's supposed to protect the American business person from fear and from coercion. In 1950, Emanuel Seller, who was a congressman who ran the same anti-monopoly committee that is today investigating big tech, said the following. Under our ancient common law, your neighbor must not point a gun at you, even though he has never shot anyone. Similarly, our antitrust laws were intended to protect businessmen not only from violence, but from fear of violence. Now, I want to give you a lens through which you can see this political moment as one of conflict, not between the right and the left, but between, but between independent business and monopoly and financial power. One has traditionally represented freedom and equality, the other aristocracy and even dictatorship. In telling you this story, it's important to know that as bad as our current political and economic situation might seem today, we have been in situations like this before, and there are actually reasons for hope. So I go back to the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, which, you know, a lot of people know flapper, flapper girls, stock market, but in many ways it was a really frightening decade. Um, it was ze really xenophobic. It was the, the one where, where Congress radically restricted immigration. All over the world, uh, fascists were rising in Italy. That was, that was the beer hall putsch in, in Germany. The KKK here had 4 million members and, and multiple senators were, were KKK members. So was the, and it wasn't just a Southern thing. The mayor of both Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon in the early 20s was a KKK member. Concurrent with these authoritarian and deeply racist trends was the dominance of monopoly in a host of, Amer of areas in American life. That was the decade when chain stores really emerged. In fact, we had an Amazon style corporation back in the 20s, but it was called, you'll know the name, the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company or the ANP. AMP seems kind of friendly today, but it was not in the 1920s. We also had, as we are beginning to see today, political pushback against these dominant corporations. Now, a key part of the battle I'm describing runs through a little known social crusade, little known today, uh, in the 20s and 30s, which was called the anti-chain store movement. This movement, perhaps wearing different clothing, is making a comeback in the age of Amazon, as well as all the other monopolies we're seeing in America. But fundamentally, it was a pro-business anti-monopoly movement. Now here's politician Huey Long making a similar point to Cicilline, although maybe more clear. I would rather have thieves and gangsters than chain stores in Louisiana. Now in his nominating speech for the 1936 Democratic Convention, and this is just to show you how embedded this idea of commercial freedom was in the old school Democratic Party, Franklin Delano Roosevelt framed the point even more clearly. We stand committed to the proposition that freedom is no half and half affair. If the average citizen is guaranteed equal opportunity in the polling place, he must have equal opportunity in the marketplace. Now, there was a key character in this fight, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, made a point about regional inequality and despair that we might recognize today. Chain stores, he said, are converting independent tradesmen into clerks. 
and sapping the resources, the vigor, and the hope of the smaller cities and towns. Another key character is a character in my book, Texas Congressman Wright Patman, sought to protect our political independence. And he said, small business enterprise is a symbol of a society where a hired man can become his own boss. Now the emergence of chain stores, whether A&P or Amazon, is not and has never been due to technology. It's a big myth. 1911, the Supreme Court decision of Dr. Miles opened the door to the A&P chain by changing rules around pricing. And pricing, as you know, is core to how we do commerce and organize power. The court allowed retailers and discounters to price goods below cost and to bargain aggressively with suppliers to get better terms if they, terms if they were bigger. Now, a and which was a small chain, got a big loan from Wall Street. By 1915, a and had 2,000 stores, and by 1920, it was the biggest retailer in the country. a and became a massive buyer of all kinds of goods and began using that power as another monopoly Standard Oil had. Their two basic tactics were as follows. This was on pricing. The first was loss leading, which was using the sale of popular branded items at near or below cost to bring in customers. And the second was price discrimination, which in A&P's case was to use bulk buying power to get better terms than their smaller competitors for the same items, and then use those superior terms to eliminate competition. They also privileged the power of larger suppliers. The corporation demanded kickbacks in the form of advertising allowances from suppliers. Basically, an allowance was a manufacturer paying A&P money to stock their product in stores. This still ha this happens today now. Bigger suppliers could afford such allowances, while smaller ones couldn't. Now, roughly a quarter of the firm's annual profit was in the form of these kickbacks. Now, a and like Amazon today, charged low prices to get customers in the doors. It then aggregated that buying power it had to bludgeon suppliers, including packaged goods makers, farmers, and workers. For instance, it demanded cream of wheat, give, a, give it better terms for buying cereal than its competitors. It hired detectives to beat up strikers to keep labor costs low. It expanded its buying power over farmers by pulling together a distribution division that traded fruits and vegetables, selling not only to its own stores, but those of its competitors, kind of an early platform model. Now, some of A&P's success was, was related to technology and innovation. Cars were new in the 20s. Cars allowed shoppers to go beyond their local stores, drive to chains. But the problem was that the law didn't distinguish between profiting based on finding superior ways of organizing the grocery business and profiting by just having more buying heft and being, having access to capital. As a and exploded in size, producers and small proprietors organized the political movement. States, not just small, medium-sized producers as well. States and the federal government passed laws to block price discrimination, bar kickbacks, and reduce or end loss leading to, to create dominance in markets. These legal changes didn't drive the chains out of business, but they did level the playing field. So from 1935 to 1937, grocery chain stocks fell by roughly 60%, while the stock market itself went up by 8%. The market share of chain grocery stores went down, and the number of family-owned retail outlets went up. The company responded with a political campaign itself. It poured millions into consumer groups, farmer groups, and fake front groups. Its owners offered jobs or loans to FDR administration officials and even one of FDR's kids. a and cut a deal with organized labor to get labor to use its political muscle to defend chain stores. Unions soon attacked unsavory and inviting small stores. Now, the rhetoric got heated, right? Patman introduced a bill that would essentially tax chain stores out of existence. Let's keep Hitler's methods of government and business in Europe, he said on NBC radio in 1940 attacking the a and The DOGs say uh, that the government sued a and for civil and criminal antitrust violations in the 1940s. The net of the battle is that by the, the late uh, 1940s, there was a truce. a and was unionized and was unable to discriminate against farmers or packaged goods producers. And it had, to, it had to compete based on quality of its service and not power. Also dissolved its distribution arm. Chain stores existed side by side with independent retailers. And until the 1970s, we prevented size and access to capital from being a main ingredient in success and in doing so, protected the ability of small and medium sized producers, distributors and retailers to operate in open markets. But in the 1970s, the consumer rights movement on the left changed our conception of social justice. 
Naive new consumer rights groups and political leaders were persuaded by the legal establishment that fair trade laws, the laws that had blocked A&P, were simply protectionist rackets designed to help special interests. These are the people that wouldn't think of committing discrimination in a sociological context, and that would horrify them, said a small business advocate in the 1970s. But in an economic context, it becomes the thing to do. Distinguishing between big and small business, honest and dishonest business, became foolish, irrelevant, not important. In 1974, the legislative director of the Consumer Federation said repeal of the fair trade laws is one of the things we will work hardest on. Public Citizen, a new consumer rights group started in 1971 by Ralph Nader, announced a great deal of interest in repealing the law. So in the 1970s, we eliminated or stopped enforcing laws against price discrimination or predatory pricing. And in the 1980s, we stopped enforcing antitrust laws in general. Today, Amazon and many businesses like Amazon drive price concessions and discriminatory pricing as A&P did. So one very well-known example is Amazon's choice to lose up to $100 million a month to undercut the, the price of one of its competitors, which was Quidzy or Diapers.com, until that company chose to sell out to Amazon. It's just classic predatory pricing. Amazon didn't even make money for its first 20 years of existence just so it could capture market power. Try competing against somebody that doesn't have to make a profit. It's not just Amazon. The ability to generate buying power and then use it to attack suppliers is now the business model of choice. Walmart pioneered it in the 1970s after these laws were repealed, but it's everywhere now. Now, when I was a congressional staffer, I was lobbied by an office supply producer concerned that a merger of two office chain stores, Staples and Office Depot, might, might destroy them. Why, I asked, don't you or other suppliers oppose the merger publicly? Fear, fear of retaliation. Now, when Brandeis talked of a nation of tradesmen versus a nation of clerks, or when Huey Long referenced thieves and gangsters, this is what they meant. Large corporate chain stores frighten business people into submissiveness, and they sap the vigor from small towns, and they do it not with guns, but with price. Today, the power of monopoly, of big tech, of, of concentrated finance seems insurmountable. Taking on these companies in some ways even seems kind of weird, like un-American, like it's out of the American tradition, something that requires government intervention in markets, which is just, we've never done that before. So this weird myth say states. But in fact, the most American thing that we can do is to protect our liberty at the ballot box, in the marketplace, in the way that you do, as business people speaking out on behalf of honest and just ways to do business and commerce. Now, to give you a sense of how connected these struggles are, how connected a and P struggle is today, consider that in 2018, a former Republican and a former Democratic top antitrust enforcer, they these two guys, they collaborated, were paid by Amazon to write a paper justifying a and P's pricing practices in the 1920s. Amazon and its attorneys understand that its power is not related to technology or scale, but law, the law that justifies that corporation wielding power the way it does. In America, the law, if we are bold and follow what our predecessors did, can actually turn into a tool of liberty and not just a tool of injustice. So that's what I have to say, and I'd love to take your questions, and, and uh, I am honored to speak to you, and I, I love what you do, and I think it's incredibly important that you as business people are speaking out. Great, thank you. Um, that was great. So let's see. We will go to, I actually saw a question that I was kind of interested in, and. Um, on from multiple angles. Um, is there a connection between private equity and illicit financial flows through offshore financial centers? Um, yeah, and I guess I would just add to that. Do you think that um, the sort of globalized financial, you know, that it's now become a lot more globalized? Is that, how is that either making the situation different than it was in the 1920s or you know, just those differences, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, uh, private equity is a largely un unregulated sort of stream of, um, of financial arrangements, not entirely unregulated. I, I also don't, private equity is such an or Orwellian term. Um, 
when we when we talk when you talk politically about private equity as as sort of problematic, usually what people mean is is the large the larger PE firms that layer a lot of debt on their portfolio companies. We're not talking about the small you know Boston based search firm or you know that goes around and tries to you know put some money into small companies for growth. That's not what we're talking about. That's just investing. Um, uh, private private equity is, I think, uh, there was there was sort of private equity style stuff, you know, throughout American history, and usually the courts uh, cracked down on it because the the basic problem with private equity, what I'm talking about, the mate, the mega cap leverage buyout stuff, and monopolies is, is pretty similar, which is which is what what they would Thurston Veblen called absentee ownership, which is to say the entity that has um, control or ownership of a network or, or firm doesn't actually have responsibility for it. So the paint the person, um, they, so they, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, he, he has control over Facebook, but you know, what's happening in, in at the edge of his network, the conspiracy theorists or the people in, you know, Myanmar that are using it, that, that he doesn't li live near that. So there's a kind of absentee ownership is the way that we talked about that. Private equity is the same, except that the business model of the large mega cap, extractive firms is that they can layer debt onto their portfolio firms that they control but then if those firms go bankrupt they're not liable for them so it's actually baked into the legal structure that they can just use the these these firms kind of as limited liability shells to transfer money from from lenders to themselves and that that's a that's a legal problem it's also a philosophical uh fight over the what property rights actually mean and then the, the tax scams and the money laundering through PE is just a function of the fact that they're not really kind of doing business. They're just kind of like trying to capture value that others create and not and pay no attention and, and take no responsibility for how financing and business flows within their um, empires. And again, there are a lot of really good people in this industry. There are a lot of good financing that these guys, that, that the smaller guys do. So I don't want to paint with a broad brush that whole industry. I'm mo mostly talking about the, 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 the large mega cap guys, the sort of Steven Schwartzman's um, Blackstone KKR types. Yeah. Um, and so, and your recommendations are, are really just to, are legal um, in nature, trying to prevent that kind of behavior in the marketplace. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, that the, what, what the two, I mean, there's a number of things you could do. I mean, fee disclosure is important, but also, you know, making reunited control and responsibility. So making general, you know, private equity firms liable for the debt that they incur on their portfolio firms. If you borrow the money, you have to pay it back and you can't just attach it to some subsidiary as a legal shell. And there are other things you need to do just in terms of, of um, uh, making you know if, if, if a PE firm comes and buys a company and wants to lay a bunch of people off they should have to pay severance so that you don't make money by just finding people to fire um, and then there's just a bunch of things that you need to do to address kind of antitrust law and a whole bunch of ways to prevent cheating in general markets which PE is particularly good at finding those loopholes and exploiting them so you you gotta you know re recapture our ability to govern private power more broadly great yeah, so uh, I saw a few other questions come in. I'm going to try and synthesize these. Um, just given the sort of, uh, I guess, more on the ground level political issues there, you know, in terms of policing, in terms of militarization of uh, policing, and um, sort of this felt sense uh, of, you know, there's some insecurity in, in certain cities across America. Um, do you see any, uh, I guess, overlap between these activities, these policing activities or militarized activities around the country and what was going on in the 20s? Is it something to have an extra layer of concern about? Or is it, again, just something, you know, we've been here before and it looks different and, but, you know, essentially it's the same, it's the same power dynamic. Yeah, I mean, it's never, it's never quite the same. It's always like, you always have new technology and you always have sort of new culture. I mean, in the, in the twenties, um, you know, like, first of all, I mean, so you could, there were actually battles in the coal mines. Like you could kind of shoot your, you could shoot miners. Like it was frowned upon, but you could do it. Uh, I, 
Richard Mellon, who was the brother of the Treasury Secretary and the Richard, the, one of the richest men in the country, was asked at a hearing in 1928, could you run a, um, a coal mine without machine guns? And he said, I don't see how you could. And then he was like, oh, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. And it was like this kind of this big controversy. Um, it, so, you know, so, so there, there was actually the, the only time that the U.S. I think government has used airplanes domestically to bomb people was in the 1920s. Um, so, so it was, it's pretty bad. Um, I, I think the militarization that you see today is pretty scary as well. Um, but, you know, this is kind of a question about how we want to govern our society. And it's, it's putting that question to us in a very explicit and scary way. Um, is it, is it, is it related to, I think it's very much, I think one, one of the interesting things about the, the problems that we're dealing with now, and I think you got, you guys probably understand this as business people is that there's such domination and coercion in our business structures and our markets. And yet that doesn't, and that's where a lot of social justice work. That's where a lot of social justice is structured, right? Who can get access to capital, who can start businesses, who can get access to markets. And yet the discussion about social justice in sort of the political realm is completely divorced from where, from, from what's happening in our markets. And I just think that's a, that's a, a huge opportunity in terms of, of kind of unifying those two areas. Um, yes. And actually the next question sort of, I think will speak a little bit to that. Um, can you talk about monopoly power in rural communities, specifically in food, farming seeds meat packing uh these types of industries and i think yeah there is some uh overlap there with also social justice issues if you could speak to that yeah i mean so so a good part of the american tradition if you go back to and this isn't i'm not saying it's a great there's obviously like really terrible aspects to it but broad land distribution was a big part of how Americans saw, um, particularly white men in America, like saw how to structure a republic. And so, you know, traditionally uh, outside of the South, it was like, we'll give little plots of land so that individual families can live on those land. And we won't have great estates of aristocracy. Now, um, what you see, you know, and, and most of the country, most of the workforce were farmers. From, from much of American history. What you see today in rural America, especially if you're a farmer, but, but you know, in, in other, the, most people in rural America are not farmers, but the agricultural economy is, a, is significant. Um, if you're a farmer, you are surrounded by uh, institutions that control you. Seeds and chemicals, the, these, are, these are, there's a few giant seeds and chemicals conglomerates, they can, they control you, they can raise uh, prices on seeds and chemicals. Uh, fertilizer, the ability to, to sell your crops is controlled by a few giant trading companies. If you are a, a chicken or pork producer, you know, you are essentially not really independent at all. And there are no markets in which you can sell your pigs or your chickens it's controlled by Tyson's or Smithfield. Um, and you, you, you know, the credit, it's, it's, it's increasingly difficult to get credit. Um, it's just, um, Farm, I mean, dairy, you've got a few giant co-ops that are controlling the business. It's, it's increasingly difficult to be a, a, a working farmer and own some land and grow things. And this is not because it's less profitable to grow food. It's, it's I think this is, this is that something like since the 1980s, you know, the farmer was getting 40 cents of every dollar that was spent on the shelf, on the grocery shelf. Oh yeah, of course, grocery stores are really putting, you know, the consolidation there is putting massive deflation on the, on the whole sector. But um, uh, today it's something like 15%, right? So, so most of the decline in revenue to farmers is as a result of a rise of middlemen. Um, and, you know, these middlemen are in Bentonville, Arkansas, or they're in, in um, you know, so it's, it's, I guess, Walmart or Tyson's and um, Monsanto Bayer and so on and so forth. So that's a, yeah. I mean, there are other aspects of the rural economy. You've got Walmart and dollar stores that are changing, you know, that have undermined a lot of the main streets you have uh, in the towns, you have you know, opioids, you have just the, the healthcare system in rural America is a disaster. Um, so there's just, there's, and that's all monopolized. I mean, it's really everywhere. And it, it's not that hard to fix, but we just have to figure out, like we have to get our politics, our, our political leaders to actually think about, oh, we want to fix this. This is a political problem that we can address. 
Yeah, and I guess, and um, so yeah, speaking of it not being that hard to fix. Um, so oh, also, sorry, there's also transportation. So it's harder to get to rural America these days because we deregulate in airlines and let them all consolidate. So it's harder to fly to places. The um, railroads have increasingly cut service to a lot of places. So, so you know, you have, um, if you're a farmer and you're shipping your crops from railroad, it's, I mean, it's, it's increasingly hard to do that too. So it's like, it's, it's kind of, you're surrounded by, by monopolies. Yeah, and oh, and I wanted to say to everybody, I am seeing everybody's questions on Q&A and chat. And so I will, we will definitely try to get to all of them. Um, so this question relates to, to what we were just speaking about. Um, what can small businesses do in, you know, in these more rural areas, in these harder to reach areas? Uh, is sort of federal uh, government intervention necessary? Um, is it both? Is it municipal and federal? Um, Yes, it's all of the above, and and you can do it. It depends on the market. So sometimes there are there are also private. Uh, you can bring private antitrust cases if you want. Although that's they really limited the law there. But I mean, what can individual uh, businesses do? I mean, you could ask your uh, political leaders to enforce or strengthen antitrust laws, uh, and that can happen. Every state has antitrust laws, uh, and every. Um, uh, and the, the federal government obviously does. A lot of municipalities have a lot of things they can do. But there are um, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, we work a lot with them. They just came out with a really wonderful report on all of the things that local governments can do to address concentrated power. Everything from, you know, public broadband to, uh, you know, to actually creating public markets. In a lot of places, there just aren't supermarkets and you know, local cities can actually address that. Um, so that's, a, you know, a place to look. But I would, I would just say, it, I think it's important to just tell your political leaders that you are a business and you want to see more aggressive antitrust laws and, uh, and enforcement. So, oh, go ahead. No, no. I mean, and then there are, you know, it depends on the market too. So if you're a restaurant, there are some towns uh, like their Grubhub and, and um, Uber Eats and Postmates have really started to be aggressive towards restaurants. But, you know, in some places you can have the city council cap their prices. In other places, there are actually uh, kind of co-op style um, food delivery services that you can join. So there, there are also sort of private, you could build things too. All that. I, I generally think about policy, but you, there, are other, there are other ways you can do it, but they have to be paired. You can't just build your way out of this. Mm -hmm. The um, so there's some questions here about sort of the um, relationship between monopoly and small communities' wages. Um, let me see if there's anything to, you know, just the wage stagnation that we're experiencing clearly, um, how that relates to monopoly or, um, you know, or how it relates to labor, I guess, in general, you know, well, first of all, people that own and run businesses um, have incomes. And so there is a difference if you have a, say, Walmart with one family controls 10,000 stores versus having 10,000 families controlling a store apiece. That's a lot of, you know, that's, that's a change in, I mean, people that we don't typically divide. We don't really often think about business owners as people who work for, you know, and get income, but it, they are. And the putting the locus of economic decision making in more hands is a good thing. Um, also, generally speaking, what you find when you have large concentrations of power is that um, they tend to suppress wages, not only within their own stores, but across the supply chain. So you might have seen that, you know, Amazon raised their um, warehouse wages in some ways to $15 an hour, but that, you know, is really, uh, you know, and that's fine, that's good, but, um, but, that, but in terms of just crushing suppliers and their ability to make money and therefore pay their workers more, I mean, that's, uh, that, that's a real, that's, that's pretty significant. I mean, I hear it from people that run franchises, you know, they're like, look, I wanna pay my workers more and I just can't because the way that the franchise terms are structured make it impossible for me to make enough money to pay them more. And that's, a fun that's really a function of extraction. So when you see the extraction at the top, 
you know, pulling from all of these companies at a mid tier and, and, and a, a, a lower tier, that just, that's going to reduce aggregate wages in all of these parts of the, of the economy as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think addressing concentrated financial power at the top, you know, I mean, that's, that's how you, you know, you create a high wage economy. You also have to organize workers and, and producers. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Labor unions and co-ops and changes in patent law or copyright law and farm supports. And, but, you know, you, you can't just put out the fire. You also have to stop the arsonist from setting new fires. Yeah, and I think the other side of that, just speaking as um, a restaurant owner myself for 10 years, uh, I think there was a lot of tension in uh, watching um, minimum wage rise and uh, while at the same time, you know, not having the ability to really change other costs of the business. So once you're already operating on single digit, you know, margins, right. there's this kind of like disconnect where we weren't really you know, we just were told, you know, there's this increase, which is fine, but then it's like, how do you pass that off to the, do you pass it off to the consumer or do you, you know? Right. And then it's like, why are you against the minimum wage hike? Right. And it's just like, well, I mean, that's, that's what's missing from the dialogue. Right. And I think like one example of something that could help uh, would be to just, I mean, this is a big idea, but there's no reason not to do it. We've done it before. Nationalize the credit card companies. I mean, why should, why should small businesses have a private tax of two to 4% on every single transaction um, and also have to pay insurance for you know, uh, identity theft? And I mean, when I give you a $20 bill, you don't have to pay insurance to make sure that that $20 bill is real. You know, the Secret Service deals with that, Treasury deals with that, and you get all $20. Why is it different when I give you a Visa or MasterCard and you have to pay for all sorts of, of nonsense and deal with data and all this? That should just be a, that should be a public institution, right? And it's just crazy that we, we just don't think of this private tax that's basically going to lobbyists as a, a small business issue. And so if you were to do that, if you were to, um, I mean, the whole payment system is totally messed up. If you were to fix the payment system, that's immediately a, a, you know, a two to 5% bump for every small business in America. And then if you did a minimum wage, it would be easier to, 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 take, that, um, to take that cost increase. But fundamentally, like you have to think about, and I think this is where progressives go wrong, we have to think about power not just you know sort of some a simple split between labor and capital mm -hmm. um and so there's questions coming in about citizens united um money is speech started in the 70s uh what are some proposals uh or you know how can we fix this pro you know because there's this other added problem of you know, there's not really a democratic, pro you know, a smooth democratic process in order to all make sure all voices are heard. Um, is it really just like a simple fix in terms of Citizens United or do you have thoughts on that? I don't. I mean, I'm not in it. That other people think about Citizens United. It, okay. it, you know. Yeah. I probably I don't like it, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's see. There's one question on there being like, prove, prove that large, large mega cap private equity firms, like why do you say they're bad? So I'll just mention, like they're starting to, um, prior to 2006, it looked like if you put money into those private equity mega cap firms, you would actually outperform the stock market. Uh, post 2006, there have been a number of studies that show that those firms don't outperform the stock market, but they do extract large fees and they are using a lot of leverage. So effectively they're borrowing a ton of money betting that the stock market or that equity values will go up. And then the difference between the um, amount that they make just from betting with borrowed money and sort of the return, they take that in fees. So it's actually not, uh, it's actually not doing a good job in terms of moving you know, uh, pension money into the real economy. Um, but the, the, the risk is, um, the return is actually, the, the fees are hidden. Um, because it's risk that we haven't, uh, that, that we don't see, you don't see it in the returns yet. But that risk is there. It's all, you know, it's pooled there. And, and so it's pretty dangerous stuff. I could go into like why big, big mega cap private equity is, 
problematic for other reasons, but just fundamentally, it's not a good investment. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, do you want to go into UBI, universal basic income, and how that relates to, uh, you know, monopoly and power? Right. So I, I am not a UBI person. I am. Uh, I I think that the idea that we have, you know, a job is just at a basic level, a job is just a, a we give somebody green pieces of paper uh, in order to solve a problem. That's what a job is at a very basic level. So if you're going to say that we don't have any more jobs, then you're saying we don't have any more problems to solve. And I think that's a really narrow understanding of our, of our society. I also think it's dangerous to put everybody on government payroll because then you, it's too easy to start saying, well, this subgroup of people should not be getting their UBI if they're a criminal. You don't want criminals to get UBI, right? That's, that's what they have in Alaska with the Alaska Fund. You know, if you're a convicted criminal, you don't get that. And then they can just throw other people in there and be like, that's a bad group. And like what you're doing is you're centralizing, even though it seems like a good idea, you're often centralizing power in the hands of, uh, of the government. And while, you know, I am generally, I think public institutions do need to be running more of our society. I also am a Brandeisian. I'm skeptical of all concentrations of power. So I think dividing up uh, property so that everybody has a little piece of property is fundamentally a safer way to structure a, a democratic republic. That's interesting. What do you then think about, um, I mean, I tend to agree with you, but, uh, and I'm not speaking very SBC right now, by the way, folks, um, but what, uh, you know, just in terms of how we measure productivity um, with wages, um, you know, just speaking to the sort of essential worker crisis that was going on, you know, like not supporting um, certain types of labor over other types of labor. And do you think that productivity, are you relating productivity to problems, I guess, to your earlier point there? Well, I think productivity, the productivity decline that we've seen really since the early 70s is, is related to the fact that people can't uh, have a tougher and tougher time innovating and building businesses. Um, you've seen a decline in small business uh, formation since the early 80s. In the 1970s, I think you've had interest rates and inflation. And so there was a lot more focus um, in corporations on treasury cash management than on actually running the business better building new factories and building better products. So I think a lot of the productivity slowdown is a result of um, much more aggressive focus on finance and, um, and market power as opposed to just making better goods and products and services. Just to give you a stat, Thomas Philippon is an economist, um, and we know this in, sort of intuitively, but there's not that much work on it. But he found that sort of traditionally, the American financial system, which is just designed to match savings and investment, that's all it does at, at a basic level, um, it typically took about 2% of GDP, just historically, that's the average to do all that. Um, in 2012 or 13, just profits, bonuses, and um, wage, and yeah, profits and bonuses for the financial sector were 9% of GDP, right? That's, a, that's, a, about, a, that's about a trillion dollars more than it should be. That, that's a fat financial sector and an inefficient financial sector. That's, you know, you got your best people in, your brightest minds are focused on getting people to click on ads or, or creating toxic credit instruments. You're not going to see a lot of productivity growth. Yeah. Um, let's see. Is anything catching your, I, there's so many questions. There is a question here about, there's a few questions here about African-American reparations. Um, do you, yeah, how do you yeah. relate? I, I think reparations is, you know, I I wasn't sure about reparations because I don't, I just didn't understand the, the dynamics there. And then I did, a, I wrote a piece for the American Prospect on how Comcast is boxing out uh, black owned media creators and they, they, they bought NBC and they, you know, did that. And 
what's interesting is that is that there are one that's one of the areas in the economy where you because you you saw a lot of of um, black entertainment moguls starting making money in the 1980s that's one of the few places where there was enough capital um for black owned uh, uh, black leaders had enough capital to enter in and they had the knowledge and expertise and networks in that business. There's still a lot of problems because of the monopoly. But I, what I did come to understand is that the, the lack of money in uh, black communities just completely warps our politics, totally, like in, in all areas, and is a fundamental inhibition on freedom. And so I think about monopoly and market power, but if you don't have capital to enter markets, to start businesses, it, it's not that monopolies are besides the point because they are still harmful, but you're leaving out a big part of the problem. So my view of reparations, I mean, I take a more kind of like Hebrew law type of approach, which is just, we should just have a jubilee, right? Debt forgiveness plus, you know, Thomas Paine, a little bit of property goes to everyone. I don't care if it's when you're 21, you get a big chunk of money to start a business or whatever. I like. I think that would be a really good thing to do, um, and it would be have a particularly important effect on uh, in black communities because just the lack of capital is so extreme and so problematic in like 85 different ways. Uh, so I think it would be an incredibly great thing for the country. I think it would make our country way more like awesome and fun and interesting. And I've come to believe that it's actually quite important um, to actually build a, a country that is that is just. But there are questions about administrability. Um, I, I saw somebody wrote a piece saying, um, you know, anybody who is a, has documentation that they had ancestry who were, who were slaves would get cash payments. And I think there's sort of interesting questions about like, wait a second, what if you don't have documentation? There's a lot of questions there. So I think it should be much more like sort of broader and just kind of like simpler, you know, kind of you're just going to put a lot of property in people's hands um so that you know and you're not going to like try to administrate it administer it perfectly just because i think it's so the, the the property skew is so extreme now and that would have such a, a massively beneficial impact to our society yeah you talk about that i think in the book right and you're in goliath there isn't there was a history where the homestead act did at one point yeah, we've we've done this before. I mean, the Homestead Act, like before the so the 1930s, the New Deal, a lot of the farm supports and small business supports, you know, the VA, a lot of that stuff was designed to equalize property ownership, mostly among white white people, but not entirely by the 1930s and 40s. It had changed a little bit, but that was actually modeled on the Homestead Act, which was part of uh, the Civil War reforms. So the Civil War had two massive moments of redistribution of property. One of them was the Bring of the slaves, which is, you know, taking a whole bunch of people who are considered property and saying you're not property anymore, which is a huge, you know, uh, redistribution in, in that's one way to think about it. Um, it. Obviously, that's a very narrow and constrained way that I don't think about it that way, but that's one way to think about it just economically. But the other thing that happened was the Homestead Act, which was basically taking a lot of land, stealing it from Native Americans and then giving it to a bunch of white settlers in small plots. So it's sort of like a really, um, you know, it was the origin was kind of ethnic cleansing. And then the, the way that uh, American, the American government dealt, dealt with, like arranged it is that they said, well, this is a good way to create equality for white, for white people give out little plots of land. And something like 10% of Americans today are descended from people who were homesteaders. And then they, a lot of the homesteaders formed the backbone of the populist movement in the 1880s and 1890s, small plots, small farmers being driven off their land by railroads and, and whatnot. So then the New Deal was kind of modeled in some ways off of that. And, um, you know, we can do something like broad property ownership today, although hopefully like not a racist way to do it. Like it's like we should do the New Deal, but not a rate, but not racist. Right. That's kind of the way that I think about it. So we, since we, we have like a few minutes left and it seems like people would like to hear more about Amazon and Google, I see, you know, how do you tackle a monopoly like Amazon that controls so many polit politically strong assets, media? Um, is the problem mainly that, you know, regulators have no interest in eliminating them or is, have the laws been eroded to such an extent that they um, are no longer, you know, able to really stop 
them? Is the is the issue international? Is it you know? No, I think it's. I think these are just signposts of you know these are huge problems in and of themselves. Amazon and Google and Facebook. What they the reason they're so powerful though is is because we've seen a broader collapse of the rule of law, right? So it's not that Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg, these are not geniuses. These are just guys that are good at grabbing things. And they're smart, but they're good at grabbing things. They're not like gods or monsters. They are governing our commerce because we the people refuse to through our public institutions. But they exist for the same reason that we didn't send anyone to jail after the financial crisis and at the top level, because we, we don't believe in the rule of law for the powerful anymore. And you know, that's true in lots of different ways. You can see it in militarization. You can see it, you know, CIA torture. No one went to jail for that. Like all of that, you know, we just don't, we have decided as a society, or we haven't yet decided as a society whether we are a liberal democracy or not. Now it becomes very obvious when we don't enforce rules and laws against powerful institutions in business, what happens? Well, you get an Amazon, you get a, you get a Facebook, you get a Google. And if Mark Zuckerberg didn't exist, you know, if he had never been born, there would be another person there doing exactly what he did or doing a slight modification of it. Rolling up these spaces and monopolizing them is fundamentally about committing mass crime, but crime that we have legalized because we don't enforce our antitrust laws or our regulations and we don't, um, and because we don't enforce law. So as an example, in Portland, Portland passed a price cap on food delivery apps. What did, I think it was, maybe it was Grubhub that did this. They just ignored the law. They just said, we're not going to pay it. Or if we do, we're just going to put a $3 surplus fee uh, because we want to, and we're funded by Wall Street. I mean, that you need political leaders that are going to say, we're going to put you in jail for that. Like, we're going to put handcuffs on you. And until you have that, until we demand that our political leaders enforce the law on everyone, you're going to continue to see these institutions become more powerful and coercive and sort of govern in place of our you know, public officials that, that have chosen not to. I'm hopeful about this. I do think like what we're seeing in Congress, starting to see some moves there. We're starting to see some moves in Europe. We're starting to see some moves, you know, in the federal government. I think we can get there. It does require, it's going to require a broad social movement to do it. Yeah, let's, maybe let's uh, finish with, um, yeah, some hopeful, some, you know, do you have any examples, anything we can be, you know, following or, uh, you know, watching in the media or watching um, now that Senate is, the Senate is back? Um, watching for that, yeah, points to some progress in this area? Yeah, so, so uh, well, what you guys are doing is important. We're going to be doing some stuff on, um, like, I, I'm not supposed to announce it, but we'll be do some, doing some stuff in the next couple of weeks to organize, uh, in particular areas, uh, organize business, businesses and, and workers in particular areas on, on, uh, on certain platforms. Um, but I think one thing you can look at is the, um, uh, there's a hearing on Monday on the antitrust subcommittee where the CEOs of Apple, Google, Facebook, and Amazon are all going to be testifying to the antitrust subcommittee, which is doing this long investigation into corporate power. And I think that that's going to be, it could be an interesting hearing. I mean, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll hear this kind of conflict between de democratic institutions and the most powerful business leaders in America. So that's something to watch. And then I think more broadly, you know, uh, you're, you're, seeing, uh, you're seeing pushback in lots of different areas of the economy. Every market is different. Um, you know, a lot of sectors have their own rules and laws. So I would encourage you to, whatever sector you're in, push back on those particular rules, because I really feel like the authority that business leaders and business people have is pretty profound. Policymakers care about what they say, not about like, you know, it areas outside of their business, but, but if you, you know, make pickles and you're like, I, here's the problem in the, in the pickle market. We can't get enough cucumbers because of these arrangements in farmers. Like policymakers are going to listen to you on that because they know you know what you're talking about. They're not necessarily going to listen to you on kind of other things that you might think that just, you know, it's just your opinion. But I feel like that authority, speaking with that authority on behalf of how to do business in a just way, is very powerful. That is, yeah, that is a very good point. And that is, um, we'll, look, we'll look forward to what AELP is uh, up to in the next few weeks. Um, so I think, let's see, I'm trying to see if there's any 
other? Also read my book. That's one other thing. And I, and I don't say, I spent a lot of time on my book and I was, it really kind of goes into the history here. And there's a lot of different, the book kind of, it's a fun read, but it also teaches people how to do anti-monopoly work, right? It teaches you how to think about the world in a way that lets you see how to take on, you know, the legal underpinnings of power. And it, it'll arm you with the historical knowledge that you need. You know, we are guided by our historical traditions. It will give you that tradition to let you kind of advocate for these broad principles, which are, you guys are already advocating for. for. So I think it would be, be the kind of thing that might be of interest. It's just a different way of looking at the world. Yeah, I think, you know, and I think just if you could maybe, t I've been thinking personally just a lot about, um, you know, culture of a sort of civic responsibility or, you know, small business leadership responsibility um, in our communities. Because uh, I think that, you know, I seem to remember from your book also, um, you know, what happened in the 80s and 90s. And I think there's just been some either forgetting um, about that aspect of, of participation um, yeah, well, no, what happened, I mean, it's crazy, like, I mean, it's just like a, a kind of, in the 19, late 1970s, basically, Democrats, you know, they were persuaded by the consumer rights people that, that all business was the same, and so then, like, they stopped understanding the importance of, of small business and the importance of open markets, and they got really confused because there were a bunch of really serious economic problems in the 1970s that were just a result of New Deal rules kind of breaking down their and the train system went bankrupt. New York City went bankrupt. There were a whole bunch of corporate bankruptcies. I mean, inflation. This wasn't like a plot or a conspiracy. The system was breaking down. But the, 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 the new Democrats that were coming in office didn't know what to do. And so they kind of like, and they had been taught that monopolies were good. And this I go into in my book, which is like messed up, right? It really was a failure of ideas. And then they started listening to the Chicago school guys because those, those people were like, oh, we've really thought about this and here are a bunch of solutions, just allow concentrations of power. And then in, in the 1980s, those same Democrats, like I noticed as I was researching, I was like, oh, this person was confused in the 70s and then by the 80s, they were on you know, Michael Milken's payroll. Um, and that like, is kind of the story, that was the new Democrats, that was Bill Clinton's generation. And what confused everyone is by the 1990s, when Bill Clinton got, gets in and actually kind of doubles down on, Reagan gets rid of antitrust and allows a concentration of power. Bill Clinton doubles down on it and, global, and allows globalization and you know, brings monopolization to the defense base, does a whole bunch of media, does a whole bunch of things to, to make the problems that Reagan created worse. But people didn't understand that he was doing that because there was a bubble underneath it. So by the late 1990s, people in power were like, oh, this is great. All of, you know, disposable income, even among the poor is up. We did a great job. And so it took another eight years, right, 2008, when the financial crisis happened, for people to start thinking that maybe that philosophy that was developed in the late 1970s might have some flaws. But by then, you know, that's, that's 30 years. Um, and, uh, and so uh, that, that's, that's like a generation and a half. And so part of it is rediscovering these old traditions that some people remember, but like are, are have, they, it's been a long time since we've really kind of, you know, used them. But like, that's kind of like why we're in this weird transition moment where we're rediscovering these, um, you know. So yeah, I hear a lot of questions like from people all the time. What do we do? What do we do about this? I buy your thesis. Okay, we've got monopolies anywhere. What do we do? And the answer is anything. Like the problem is so vast and so, it's in every market, literally anything that you do to address it sorry, um, will have a significant impact. I also think, um, sorry, somebody keeps calling me and I can't seem to stop them. Stop them. Um, will have a, a significant impact. And, you know, if you're running for office or if you're talking to policymakers or, you know, like, we have to recognize that grassroots power works through the ballot box and through our government. So we have to use our public institutions to govern again across all walks of society. And like, we have to really make it true that there is equal justice under law. And we haven't made that, we haven't made that true. But if we make it true, then, uh, you know, we, we can reclaim or actually claim a, a great democratic, um, I don't want to say heritage, but we can claim a, um, you know, a more perfect union. 
Um, yeah, so, and with that, uh, please also check out um, upcoming events with American Sustainable Business Council and uh, follow AELP and all, you know, so um, because I do think there's a lot of opportunities that some of these sort of like-minded organizations offer small businesses and individuals um, to increase engagement. Um, and I think that is it. It's two o'clock. So just for, so everybody knows this recording will be on the website, um, on the ASBC website later today or possibly tomorrow morning. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much, Matt. That was wonderful. Really enjoyed it. And Thanks, yeah, see you guys all later. Bye everyone.